Good morning. And a special welcome if you're here for the first time. It's great to have you with us as well. Um, welcome to Divisadero and the Coliseum. I think we're growing a little fond of Divisadero. It's kind of like camping out or a picnic in some ways, but our heart really is it, you know, it's at 2525 South Lover's Lane. One day, perhaps in June, as we expect, we'll, we'll all be there together, and that will be a great day. And we're saying, let's go, because the inspiration for that comes from Psalm 122, verse 1. Uh, King David said, I rejoiced with those who said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. So that really captures where we're at. We're eager to go to the house of the Lord. These messages are really propelling us, at least that's my desire, my prayer, my hope, propelling us toward going, toward being ready, and also toward contributing in all the ways we need to contribute. To contribute. So I've been talking about the gift, grace, generosity, um, gratitude and glorifying God. All of those messages really are drawn straight out of the deepest truths that Paul teaches churches in his letters. His uh, 13 letters of the New Testament are filled with these themes, and they are deep truths that are communicated and taught to the churches, and they reflect the truth of the gospel in Jesus Christ, what God has done for us. And so, Paul teaches these things, and they're really apropos as we think about our task of giving and supporting and contributing to the things that have to be done as we prepare to go to this new property and the building that we call our ministry center. But what I want you to know is these messages and let me re repeat them. You can, if you haven't been here with us and you'd like to review them, we have them cataloged on our, our webpage. I think they're on YouTube. Um, the, the gift, that has to do with the great gift, the greatest gift, and that is the gift of God, Jesus Christ. And then grace, gratitude, our response to grace. And generosity, which I'm going to talk about this morning from Paul's letters to the Corinthians, particularly 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9. But I want you to know that these messages really come out of my own experience as well. They're very dear and close to my heart, and they inform my devotion to God. Now, I'm just like you, because I'm a pastor, it doesn't make me weird, creepy, or unreal. I really am just like you, and I have battles every day. I'm still selfish, just like you are, but I fight it. I am inspired by Christ to be generous rather than selfish. And I want you to know that these messages, every one of them, uh, comes out of that place of my own experience with the Lord and what I have grown to know through faith in Christ and walking every day with Him. I want to tell you that everything good, pure, and true that I've done, giving, sacrifice, swallowing my pride, seeking what's best for others, I've done that because of Jesus. It's just as simple as that. 
Sometimes I feel like in, in, in any given day, many times a day, I can just come to a crossroad where I, I, want, I choose to follow Jesus. And that sometimes means denying myself. I also want you to know that that's the heart and spirit of these messages. I, frankly, yeah, I want you to be generous. I want you to be grateful. I want you to recognize God's grace in your life and be thankful for that. And as a result, become more generous. There's no doubt about that. But not just because of a certain amount of money. It's because I'm invested in this because this is for all of us. This is the way we've got to be. So that's the heart of these messages, and it's the source of what we commit to the Lord and what we commit to let's go. When we commit next Sunday on Commitment Sunday, which is generally First Fruit Sunday for us because we always dedicate November to the giving of our first and our best to the Lord. Well, today's message is on generosity. <clears throat> True generosity glorifies God. True generosity glorifies God. Not just any generosity. We, we can observe generosity, but we don't know the source of that generosity. What I'm talking about this morning is a heart-shaped generosity that echoes the very heart of God. I believe we glorify God. And you could call this private worship. It, it's kind of like what I was talking about a moment ago, off script, so to speak. Um, private worship for me is things that you never see, and you, for you, things I never see that go on between you and God. That's private worship, or what I mean by private worship. And when I talk about those little episodes during the day, you know, if, if somebody gets on my nerves, I just can't imagine any of you doing that. But if it happened, let's just imagine if it happened, and I didn't let it upset me, but I responded with kindness or generosity, gentleness, interest, those things I would tell you come from the Lord. Not from me, because when I'm out for my own interests, that's what we call selfishness. And when we're selfish, then we're choosing things for ourselves, not for others. And we're upset when others appear to crowd us or get more than they deserve or something that we deserve. So I believe we glorify God when we love others because of God, because He loves us, because He taught us how to love. Or when we give because God gave so much. See, that's a private kind of worshipful transaction going on inside of our lives that other people don't see, but God is at work in our thoughts and our heart, and we, we kind of lay this track record over years. I mean, the more you walk with the Lord, the more this, what I'm talking about is not kind of like when I took dancing lessons with Shelley, I mean, that was, you know, one, two, three, turn, bow, you know, wooden, wooden. That, you, you wouldn't even call that dancing. But when we're walking with the Lord on a regular basis, yeah, we develop this conversation, this communication with the Lord. And it, it doesn't even have to take the length of time that it would take you to write it or say it. And yet it's ever so real. So yeah, that's generosity and it's a, it's a form of worship and it's a form of, of glorifying God because you're putting Him above everyone else and yourself, right? Right? 
So, yeah, I love because you taught me how to love the Lord. I would never have loved like Jesus loves if I didn't know you. Yeah, I give because you gave so much. How can I be stingy? How can I be so stingy? And some of you know my background. You know, I grew up, hey, there are, there are no free lunches. Money does not grow on trees. Uh, there are always strings attached, uh, et cetera, et cetera. No, I didn't learn how to give or be generous in my home. I learned it in the Word of God and in His church among His people and with a wife who is very generous, who came from a long-time family of believers and followers of Jesus Christ. Or we sacrifice because the Son laid down His life for us. All those things and more, we could all share stories. But it glorifies God when we do that because of Him. I read in a, <clears throat> in, in a book written by Mark Dillon, I read this. Warren Buffett was interviewed about his $26 billion gift to the Gates Foundation. $26 billion gift. I had, to, I had to reread that. And this is what Warren Buffett said. My gift has not changed my lifestyle one bit. I still go to the movies I want to go to. And I eat at the restaurants I want to dine at. But what about the person who gives a gift that requires they can't go to the movies or eat at the restaurant they choose? And Buffett said, they are the true givers, the true heroes of generosity. The essence of generosity is self-sacrifice. What can make you sacrifice? Who can make you sacrifice? We'll sacrifice for ourselves. We'll put ourselves through all kinds of torture to achieve some objective, some goal, some higher paying job. But what, what will we sacrifice ourselves for? Or who will we sacrifice ourselves for? I'm suggesting to you that the answer to my question is that we will sacrifice ourselves for God because He sacrificed His Son for us. And what I want you to know is that's the motivation for giving. That's the motivation for generosity. If that's not there, don't give. But if it is, then you may ask, why am I not giving and giving more? God's grace inspires true generosity. This is what I, I want to read to you. This is just from the eighth chapter, and it's going to be seven verses. Verses 1 through 5, and then verse 7 and 8. I'm sorry, 8 and 9. Uh, starting at verse 1. We want you to know, or I am making known to you, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that was given to the churches of Macedonia during a severe trial brought about by affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty overflowed in a wealth, in a wealth, that means riches, in riches of generosity on their part. 
I can testify. Now, this is, this is Paul speaking, right? He's, I can testify. I was there, he is saying. I am bearing witness that according to their ability and even beyond their ability, of their own accord, nobody was twisting their arm, of their own accord, they begged us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in the ministry to the saints. And not just as we had hoped, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us by God's will. Now, pop down to verse 8 and 9. Now, Paul, remember, he speak, he's been talking about the Macedonian Christians. If you've read in your New Testament, Paul's letter to the Philippians, or Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. Um, Those are churches, those were the Christians that Paul's talking about because they were positioned in the province, the Roman province of Macedonia, which is north. If you looked at a map, it would be straight up from Greece, and Greece (laughs) is where the Corinthians, Corinth is in Greece, right? And so Paul is talking to the Corinthians. Macedonians are Greek as well, by the way, of a stripe. At any rate, here's verse 8. I am not saying this as a command. It's not a command. Rather, by means of the diligence of others... He's referring to the Macedonian Christians right there. By referring to the diligence of others, I'm testing the genuineness of your love. That's that's pretty bold, don't you think? I'm testing the genuineness of your love. So what does he say next? I mean, this lays things bare. This is about motives. What makes you tick, Corinthians? Is it Jesus? I'm testing the genuineness of your love. And then verse 9, for you know the grace of God. Now, just think about this a moment. Paul starts off what we call chapter 8, this part of his letter. He says, I want to make known to you the grace of God. Okay? I want to make known to you the grace of God that is, has been given by God to the churches of Macedonia. The grace of God is what this is all about. Don't lose sight of that. Now notice what he says to the Corinthians right here in verse 9. He says, you know the grace of our Lord. You know the grace of our Lord. Though he was rich for your sake, he became poor so that by his poverty you might become rich. He grounds it in the gift. See that? That's the gift. When Jesus Christ divested himself, we saw this in Philippians 2 when we looked at grace. This is like the entire second half of Paul's chapter, verses 6 through 11 where he talks about Jesus being equal with God, divesting himself of all riches, humbling himself, taking the form of a slave, and being obedient unto death. And then his name being raised, the name above all names. Well, that's it right there in verse 9. He grounds the grace of God in what Jesus Christ did for you and for me. And he's testing their love as to whether they really get it. Now, I want to... to, the, the, The grace of God, there's a paradox here. There's a paradox, which means it seems contrary to expectations. We expect one thing, but we get another, and we say, that's a paradox. See? And in verse 2... He wants them to know, right? So, at the beginning of verse 2 and at the beginning of verse 3, we have a that in Greek. 
And just like in English, when we want to introduce a dependent clause, we say, I know that. And then you tell us what you know, right? And so all that you know is introduced with that. So Paul says, I want to make known to you, or I want you to know, verse 2, that, and then verse 3, that. And that's what I want to bring your attention to. In verse 2, he says, uh, I, I want to make known to you the grace of God that in affliction and deep poverty, their abundant joy overflowed in the wealth of their generosity. That seems paradoxical. Because you expect when people are in profound poverty and deep consequential affliction, you're not going to find the grace of God there. And Paul says, it's just overflowing. Their joy is unquenchable. It's like a fountain that can't be staked or stopped. And then in verse 3, I want you to know that beyond their... Now, in this translation, it says ability. Another translation might say means. Those are all good translations. The word is power. According to their power, according to their ability, according to their means of their own free will. They beg Paul for the blessing of participation in the collection. Don't leave us out, Paul. We want to be a part of this. They begged him. They encouraged him. Please, we want to be a part of this. We want to be a part of the grace of God that's at work between the churches who belong to the God of grace, who belong to him because of the gift of grace, Jesus Christ our Lord. And then in verse 4, to Paul's surprise, they did this, he says. Remember, he's, he's talking to another church. He says, they did this. by first giving themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. It's easy to give ourselves to the Lord because he is so what? Gracious and good and loving. So in giving themselves to the Lord, they affirmed the sacrifice the sacrifice of Jesus Christ as the demonstration of God's great love. Giving, if it is truly giving, is giving oneself, even as we receive the giver in the gift. They gave themselves to God because of God's grace. Their sacrificial wealth of generosity, do you see that in verse 2? Does it say there... Um, a wealth or riches of generosity. This word generosity deserves a little extra attention. This word generosity is not the word generosity. This word generosity is the word in Greek simplicity. Simplicity. I'm not making this up. There's just no way to really convey the nature of the word simplicity in translation. And so the closest thing, generosity comes out of this simplicity. And this is simplicity that is rooted in the grace of God. Let me try to illustrate it like this. They were rich because of God's grace, they were rich, wealthy in simplicity, which means they were not complicated about it. They were straightforward. They were transparent. Simplicity is not cynical. 
If your faith ever gets cynical to where you're doubting and questioning, questioning my motives, for example, or questioning the motives of saying, let's give unto the Lord. Let's be gracious. And if you find yourself cynical, that's not simplicity. And that's not the work of God's grace. Because the work of God's grace issues in this, this simplicity about giving. It's not complicated by what's it going to go to or where's it going to end up or whether I've got enough. They are in communication with God through faith. And the simplicity is just overflowing. I liken it, I think this will help, I liken it to heroism. Heroism is selfless, it's daring, it's generous, it's sacrificial. I'm not sure anyone after the fact, you know, a hero, uh, someone who has dived into danger because of this extreme need, and there's no one to meet it, and this person of complete simplicity, dives in there, rescues someone. And then the camera people show up and they put microphones in the person's face and they say, you know, what's going on right now? And you, you just, I don't know if a hero can sort out the impulse. There was just this Simplicity, right? Does that help? It was, it, was, it was the right thing to do. He, she were there. And they did it. Simple. And these churches that have responded to the grace of God, they're just, they're overflowing. With this simplicity, it's like joy. What's all this joy in the midst of affliction and profound poverty? Why is it we don't experience this in our own faith? Because we're complicated. Very complicated. We doubt. We question. We qualify. We backtrack. We look at the consequences. We weigh the pros and cons. I hope that helps illustrate. I'll tell you what reminds me of this simplicity. I shared it a couple weeks back. Ellie Cardoza, that little sweet 10-year-old girl who her mom was teaching her budgeting of her money, $5 that she would uh, gain, earn, being a responsible member of the family and how to take 10% and give that to the Lord and 10% to save. And then she had 80%, but when, her, when she was questioning her mom about let's go, she said, I want to give the 80%. Just like that. No, wait, wait, child, have you thought about this? Maybe you should question that impulse. Think about what you could do with that money. Think about what if you need it. You know, it, inflation. Inflation is way up. Costs are going through the roof. You see, that's not simplicity. Ellie gave freely, sincerely, of her own accord, and from what was a gift to her. It sounds just like the grace of the Macedonian Christians that they acknowledge is theirs because of God's great grace and love. The riches of their simplicity means their act of giving is the work of God's grace. 
God participates in this. And we see this in chapter 9, verses 6 through 15. God participates in the blessing of true generosity. Let me read some of this. Chapter 9, starting verse 6. The point is this, writes Paul. The person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the person who sows generously will also reap generously. Each person should do as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly. You see, that's complication. That's complication right there. That's not simplicity. Not reluctantly or out of compulsion. Compulsion, reluctance, those things are comp complex. Complexity, not simplicity. So he's, he's saying it should be simple. Since, here's the reason, since God loves a cheerful giver. And this last week, I don't think I had assumed what that meant, but I just, as an exercise, I asked myself, John, why does God love a cheerful giver? And the answer to me is this, because God is a cheerful giver. He loves a cheerful giver because he's a cheerful giver. And a cheerful giver looks like a cheerful God. As it is written, oh, he says, verse 8, God is able to make every grace overflow to you so that in every way, always, having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. That's a lot of every right there. As it is written, he distributed freely. He gave to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now, verse 10, this is very important. Now, the one who provides seed for the sower and bread for food will also provide and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for all generosity. But again, it's the word simplicity here. which produces thanksgiving to God through us. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the proof provided by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedient confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone. And as they pray on... You know, it's really interesting when he says, let me back up there, verse 13, they will glorify God for your obedient confession of the gospel of Christ. Their generosity is a confession of the gospel of Christ. The, 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 the act that is being described there is an act of giving. But Paul signifies it as a confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone. And as they pray on your behalf, they will have deep affection for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift, which is referring to Jesus. I didn't know I was going to talk this long, so I've got to cut some stuff. Let me see what I should talk, cut. I wanted to, back in chapter 8, this letter, you know, it, it, it's got verses and chapters and things, but Paul has a running thing that he's doing when he's writing a letter like this, and we understand that because we do the same thing when we write a letter. But back in verse 13, Verse 13 of chapter 8, pardon me, verse 15 of chapter 8, he talked about how God cared for his people. They were all out in the wilderness, right? He had them right where he wanted them in the wilderness, and he took care of them generously and miraculously through the manna, okay? 
But now Paul, he uses a very basic, I mean, everyone would be familiar with agriculture. Their survival of, of the entire race of people depends on sowing and reaping, right? Agriculture, we should know. We're ag people here. Or at least we see it, even if we're not doing it. But we know if we plant something in a pot or we garden in the backyard. Paul is drawing on this fundamental principle. He says, you don't reap what you don't sow. Now, this seems contrary to the spirit of the manna, which was miraculous provision. And so now Paul leads the readers and us. Is he trying to say that numerically, we're not going to get a very big… I mean, those are the mechanics of agriculture. Yes, he is. He's talking about the mechanics of agriculture. We know that's like a calculation. You know, you only get out what you put in. But now Paul pushes it a little bit further because he's trying to stress who our God is. And in verses 10 and 11, he says, our God supplies the seed for the sower. It's not just a transaction of sowing and reaping. God's in this from beginning to end. He has his gracious hand in every success, in everything of life. He supplies the seed for the sower. And it's only then, you see, when we see it from that standpoint, that when we give, just like when a sower sows and a gardener gardeners, gardens, this is hard work up here. You can't, you, you, it, don't expect me to be perfect. But, <clears throat> you know, when, when we enter into giving, we're entering into the work of a farmer when that farmer sows. You see? When we give, we're entering into the work of a gardener because what we sow is God's to begin with, and it will bring a harvest. It real, will bring a return. And how God does it, we don't always track. Well, that sounds like a safety valve, right? <laughs> of course. I knew it was coming. We won't know. You know, it won't be like a check in the mail. But you see, that's that cynicism that has no eyes to see God's grace everywhere. And the more we give, the more we acknowledge His grace, the more we're grateful, the more we're grateful, the more we're generous, the more we want to honor and glorify such a gracious God because we see His grace in our life all the time, not just in terms of our pet projects and purposes. We see His grace in the people He brings into our lives. And when we reflect, even from a position of coming to Christ and we reflect on our lives, we go back and we see grace and God's hand in our lives that we didn't witness at the time. This is the grace that Paul's talking about. This is the simplicity that is joyous and generous. And it is this and the basis of this that I'm saying to you, don't give what I think you should give. You give what God thinks you should give. Pray. Pray. We've got Commitment Sunday coming up next Sunday. And there are these cards back there. Would you take one today? Take it with you. You don't have to put anything on it. I'm just saying take one and give some time to praying. Be thankful. Ask God what He would have you. There's three categories. There's a courageous gift. I'll, I'll be frank with you. Shelly and I have given half of my annual salary. That's a courageous gift for us. Yours might not be that big. It might be bigger. There's consistent giving. Shelly and I have supported our property since preparing the path. When we arrived 
here in Visalia and became a part of Grace Community Church. We started giving to Hook by Faith, and then it was preparing the path, and then enter the land, and now we've doubled that for our consistent 25-month giving over and above our tithes. And then the final is creative giving. I almost hate to say this, but I'm giving up Starbucks for the next 25 months. I didn't realize how much I was spending, but now it's going to the Lord. And I can do it. I think I can. I think, I think, I think, I think. And you can too. There are all kinds of creative ways. When you get into the spirit of giving, it's so joyous. I've got to quit. I had a really great illustration to lend with, but end with, but maybe another time. Maybe I'll save it for next week. I think we're going to stand up and close with some, some worship. God bless you.